thank you for having me here. I love Vancouver, it's my most uh, favorite city and I feel really honored that I can present my postdoctoral and uh, PhD results today. Um, how does this work? Oh, okay. In the urban context, class has always been a determining factor for those who could pick and choose in which block, street, city or neighborhood they would like to dwell and socialize. Space has mostly been used to maintain the social status of residents and visually highlight the disposition between the low income and middle class and the upper class from the rest. Architecture is a very visible and omnipresent tool to make those distinctions. Cities increasingly understand the importance of tenor-blind buildings to destigmatize affordable housing projects and reduce social exclusion. The social mixing of tenor blind architecture becomes particularly interesting when turn of the century buildings of former factories, schools, or businesses are renovated and rezoned for new purposes. Aside from the cost effective benefits of adaptive reuse, there is also a symbolism of wealth and long rootedness attached to these buildings. By preserving and restoring their outer appearance, the memory of prosperity that is attached to these buildings is revived. If we renovate and revamp old turn-of-the-century buildings for the 21st century, whose past are we really bringing into the present? And do such buildings really destigmatize low-income households, or do they rather displace them and eventually lead to gentrification? In order to answer these questions, I looked at four case studies set in Ontario and British Columbia. The first three are placed in formerly rundown low-income neighborhoods. And since the realization of these projects, property taxes have gone up. And the surrounding buildings have also been repurposed and renovated. The last case study, however, is set in an already well-established middle class and can be understood as an example of how to really build inclusive communities. All of the case studies have the following attributes in common. They have been repurposed into residential or mixed income buildings. They are up to five stories high, which means that they are considered low to mid-rise. They are placed at the corner of busy roads. The location of these buildings is set in old neighborhoods. And also they have been realized in collaboration between the government and the private and nonprofit sector. The term affordable housing is used often interchangeably with social housing. The big difference between these two is that social housing is rental housing that is subsidized by the government, whereas the term affordable housing can refer to anything that is part of the housing continuum, which includes uh, temporary emergency shelters, supportive housing, subsidized housing, or even market home ownership. But today, the case studies uh, include uh, rental housing that is either non-market or rent geared to income. And the reason why I chose that is because typically low-income people cannot actually afford to buy a condominium or a house. In Canada, the fe federal um, government ceased to directly be involved in affordable housing and instead the provinces uh, have been taken over the responsibility and the funding. There are many interpretations of what, affordable, uh, what adaptive reuse means. For the purpose of uh, today, the Department of Environment and Heritage definition best describes adaptive reuse as a purpose that changes a disused or ineffective item into a new item that can be used for a different purpose. Now I come to my first case study. One good example of the effect of adaptive reuse on a neighborhood's transformation is the Cornerstone Initiative set in the neighborhood Fernwood. The change from rundown low-income to vibrant middle-income neighborhood is associated with the renovation and repurpose of the former Parfit Brothers building that is situated at the corner of Fernwood Road and Gladstone Avenue. 
There is a history of wealth and success attached to the location and the building's initial purpose that was built in 1911 and functioned as the headquarter of the successful Parfit Brothers. For almost a decade, the building stood empty, vacant, and was boarded up, covered with graffiti. In 2005, the nonprofit organization Fanwood Neighborhood Resource Group purchased the building from a private owner and restored it into a mixed-use affordable housing building that provides four three-bedroom units for low-income families on the upper floor. The building's exterior appearance, as it stands today, is dominated by a translucent glass facade on the ground level and a burgundy red-painted brick facade on the upper level. The recessed entry to the coffee shop that is on the ground level, there is also an art gallery, invites the pedestrians inside the building. In doing so, the building becomes accessible to the pedestrians and fosters the interaction and socializing of the community. The realization of the cornerstone caused a spillover effect in the surrounding buildings. As a result, Fanwood's notorious crime rate fell while the property uh, tax prices rose. From 2006 to 2011, the average household income among homeowners in this neighborhood increased by 18%, which raises the question who really profited from this low-income project. The struggle for adequate and affordable housing is probably most felt in Vancouver. Neighborhoods such as Kitsilano or Yale Town that experience gentrification have become so unaffordable that even the middle class cannot afford to live there anymore. This development, where already gentrified neighborhoods become even more gentrified, is also known as super gentrification. Ironically, North America's least affordable city is also known as having the poorest postal code, which is the downtown east side. The Hotel Pennsylvania is located in this part at the corner of Carell Street and West Hastings. Originally, this building opened in 1906 as the Woods Hotel. Since 1999, it belongs to the nonprofit Portland Hotel Society, and it functioned as an SRO, which is the most basic form of shelter. In 2009, one year before the completion of the Woodward's redevelopment, the building underwent substantial restorations and renovations and opened as an affordable housing that now offers 44 self-contained studios. Some of the most striking visual parts of the post-renovation of this building are the octagonal bay window of the turret that marks the northwest corner, as well as the 1927 neon sign along the building's northern facade. From 2010, this corner has experienced massive redevelopments, such as that of the former BC Electric Railway Company building that is just opposite the, uh, this building, or the former Burns Block building on West Hastings that is now turned into Microloft's apartment. Even though the city is actively trying to impede the gentrification of the downtown east side, this part of town is also experiencing a rise in building and land value, which shows that gentrification just happens no matter what. Hamilton's image is the opposite of Vancouver's. The former steel city has been struggling to attract people to move into its deserted and deteriorated downtown core for the past few decades. But since 2010, the city has been experiencing a significant change to its housing and real estate market, which is due to an influx of migrants that are fleeing from the expensive Toronto and also Hamilton's changing workforce from blue color into white color. And Hamilton is actively supporting this change. And the buzzword is adaptive reuse. Architecturally, there is a major trend in repurposing the many century old empty and deteriorated buildings in its downtown neighborhoods. 
The former 19th century school building on West Avenue was one of the very first buildings to be repurposed. It is situated at the southwest corner of West Avenue North and Barton Street. In 2009, the private developer Spalacci Group bought the building from the province and converted it into 27 affordable housing stu stu studios. From an architectural perspective, the former school building serves as a bridge between the modernist general hospital that you can see on the left slide that is uh, uh, opposing uh, the uh, street on uh, West Avenue North. And on West Avenue North, there are uh, 20 uh, Victorian houses that were all built around 1900. I used uh, Google Street View to highlight the change at this corner. In 2007, the northern elevation of the building facing Barton Street was concealed behind trees and also covered in graffiti. But since the renovation, the graffiti was removed and the original red brick facade had been restored, which means that now this building is very visible. Since the opening of the West Avenue apartments, the tax property prices within the two block radius have significantly increased. From 2006 to 2011, the average household income amongst homeowners in this part of town increased by 30%. Oh. The more we in research the case and effect of a change in neighborhoods, the more we come to the realization that things are not black or white, but rather there are different shades of gray. The last uh, case study uh, is a good example of how to build inclusive cities. Uh, and placing a low-income household project in a middle-income neighborhood is also called Papa Potting, which is uh, defined as a tenor-blind urban development where governments place a small and monitored percentage of affordable housing into neighborhoods that consist of a predominant open market dwelling landscape. And this is a case study. It uh, used to be an old uh, factory that was sitting empty for 20, uh, for 20 years until the Hamilton-based nonprofit organization Indwell bought the building that had been empty since 1990. And in the interest of time, I'm just going to skip uh, um, explaining the building. I just want to say that oftentimes projects like this face nimbyism as there is skepticism in the middle class community regarding the kind of people who move in there. And this project was no different. But the nonprofit, along with the city of Woodward, did a lot of reconciliation work amongst the residents of Woodstock, and now it has gained recognition and a lot of support. And as a result of the acceptance and success of this project, in July 2015, it was announced that an additional 26 units will be funded and built.